Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm Josh Lipsky. I'm the Director of Policy and Programs at the Atlantic Council's Global Business and Economics Center. And we are honored today at the Atlantic Council to welcome Kristalina Georgieva, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. Now, today's event is part of our headliner AC front page series. It's our new premier live ideas platform where we bring together global leaders to discuss the most urgent challenges facing the world. So I think we really do have the perfect guest this morning. She leads an institution that is on the front lines of trying to save the global economy. And on a personal note, I'm proud to say it's an institution I was able to call home for three years. So we want everyone to engage in this virtual conversation today and ask your questions. If you're on Twitter, if you're on Facebook, if you're on LinkedIn, whatever platform you're watching on, use the hashtag AC front page, submit your questions, and we're gonna to try to get to them throughout today's chat. Now, our commitment at the Atlantic Council has been to keep you informed, not only about the current crisis, but about the changing nature of the global economy. Not only what's happening in 2020, but what's gonna happen in 2021, in 2022, and throughout the decade ahead. And I know the managing director will be able to help us in that effort today. So without further ado, let me introduce my current boss, Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and my former boss, Kristalina Gorgieva. Uh, th thank you, Josh. Um, and Josh, in a very short time, you've made a significant difference at the Atlantic Council as our Director of Programs and Strategy at our Global Business and Economics Program. And you're doing it at a, uh, I can't imagine a more critical moment. And in that spirit, Madam Georgieva, we are delighted to host you for this edition of Atlantic Council Front Page, hashtag AC Front Page. Um, uh, as Josh said, it is our headline series for global leaders. Um, and as you said in your curtain raiser speech at the IMF, spring meetings, quite unusual spring meetings held virtually, and we'll uh, talk about that later. Quote, this is a crisis like no other. With the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, you added later, humanity is facing one of its darkest periods in human memory. You're no stranger to crisis management, having been a European Union vice president and commissioner uh, during the Euro area debt crisis of 2000, uh, Euro, Euro area debt crisis, and then the 2015 refugee crisis. Reuters last week called you a force of nature. Those of us who have known you for some time realize that that's true. And they said that because of the impressive array of measures taken at your virtual uh, spring meetings. But before we get into the state of the economy, uh, the world economy, which we'll talk about, or those actions, which we'll talk about, I'd like to start on a personal note uh, for the many listening who are just getting to know you. Uh, you've been in your new job only six months, and what a six months it's been. I wonder if you could talk about the challenge in the context of other challenges you faced in your life from a personal standpoint, not forgetting that you also lived through a change of a political system uh, and economy, economic system in your home country of Bulgaria. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, uh, to everybody in the audience, thank you for joining. Uh, I am uh, in a job today in which the fact that I was a crisis commissioner for five years comes very handy. Uh, and in these days, uh, my motto was pray for the best, prepare for the worst and act decisively. Uh, what I have learned in my life is that a crisis can bring the worst out of people, but it also brings the best out of people. And I have seen enormous solidarity of people hit by force of nature or by a war. And what we need to remember is that goodness is everywhere. But the problem we face is that hate, anger, fear, they're very loud. And goodness 
is very quiet. So I, in my current job, what I want to do is not only mobilize resources, especially for the most vulnerable people and most vulnerable countries, but give a platform for us as humanity to come together and aim to have a better world on the, on the other side of this uh, crisis. And it is possible. And, and from, a, uh, from a historic standpoint, and then we'll get to some of the, uh, the naughtier issues, but from a historic standpoint, you talk about this being the uh, worst disaster in human memory. Mm. What's at stake as you talk about being a platform for humanity? What, what, what do you think is at stake if you're looking at, at history? Is this yes. time yep. like the end of World War I, the end of World War II? What would you point to? Mm -hmm. well, why is this a crisis like uh, no other? Uh, first, because uh, it is hitting us simultaneously everywhere. This is a truly global uh, crisis to block the risks to people's lives and well-being, we are stopping the world economy. And it is done everywhere. We are actually projecting this year, 2020, 170 countries to have negative per capita income growth. This is in comparison. Three months ago, we were saying 160 countries would have a positive income per capita uh, growth. So it is very massive. Uh, uh, but the most striking difference uh, is uncertainty that comes from this novel virus. We just don't know what is going to happen next. We don't know whether the, the, the virus uh, will make two rounds around the world. We don't know whether vaccine and treatment would become available sooner rather than later. And for policymakers, this uncertainty uh, is very difficult to handle, but it is also very difficult for people. And since to fight the crisis, we are retrieving in our homes, there is this risk of losing that sense of unity as a, as a, as a global community. Uh, and when you ask me what I fear most, I fear most that we, in the choice we have to make in the next months, whether we come together and we work together to bring uh, our economy up and make it a better economy, fairer economy with, with less inequalities, more equality for, 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 for countries and for people, and also a greener economy, one that would help us deal with another huge challenge we face as, as human race, this of climate uh, change. Uh, and how we make these choices would depend, of course, of leaders, and it would depend on each and every one of us. What do we want the world for our children uh, to be? Uh, so I, I take this uh, to be a also very critical for the fund, how the fund acts as an institution that brings money, advice, but also integrity, commonality of purpose. Th th thank you. Thank you so much for that rich context. The focus on uncertainty. Uh, what we want to uh, leave for our children, the greener world. So it's not just getting through this, it's coming out the other end with a better world, not a worse world. And this really speaks to the whole Atlantic Council mission about shaping the future together with allies and partners. Um, thank you for that. So the IMF coined the term, the great lockdown mm -hmm. and described what that is. Uh, you also defined uh, what the projections would be in numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, 3% uh, negative growth globally, down from earlier projections of more than 3% uh, 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 mm -hmm. growth. So that's a swing of more than 6% in projections. 7.5% down in Europe. I think it was 6.7% 6, 6 mm -hmm. for the United States, I believe. Uh, yep. Yet this, as you said, is a moving target. We don't know where it's going. So question, could it get worse? Mm -hmm. Could we have an economic decline 
worse than the Great Depression in some respects. As you look at the whole globe, where do you have the most concern? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in uh, in our uh, report in the World Economic Outlook, we actually did answer this question. Yes, it can get worse. Uh, it can get worse if during the second half of the year, there is still significant lingering impact of the pandemic that forces uh, either return to the lockdown, to the great lockdown, or uh, very uh, slow reopening of the economies. It can get even worse if the pandemic goes on a second round the world uh, trip. And we are projecting what it would mean in terms of the economy shrinking further. And uh, what we are saying in the report is that this makes it critical to manage with uh, integration of epidemiological and macroeconomic data. And that is actually the news for us for the first time in the history of the IMF. We made projections for growth based on dual modeling, epidemiological modeling and ma traditional macroeconomic uh, modeling. So where do we need to concentrate our attention? First, on responsible restart of the economies and then learning from each other as we go forward with it. And second, thinking today of the recovery and how to manage the risks that would come on the other side and their significance, more debt, more deficits, likely more bankruptcies, more unemployment, and a risk of more poverty. But there are also tremendous opportunities to shift the economy faster towards uh, the knowledge economy and to have a mechanism of our tax policies our overall macro uh, policies that favor addressing these risks in a way that do, would bring a fairer standing of, of people and countries on the other side. Uh, th th thank you for that. Um, so uh, you are the first managing director from an emerging market country. Uh, I think it's very important to uh, say that at a time where uh, the hit has not yet moved fully to emerging market countries. Uh, you have a lot of power, uh, uh, you know, $1 trillion is the number that's often cited. Mm. Uh, but I also saw in, the, uh, in the, uh, some of the documents from the spring meetings that one thought $2.5 million would be needed for emerging markets alone. So talk about uh, what's coming to emerging markets. Uh, could you have a situation unfold where the gap between rich and poor doesn't even, does not just become greater between, within a country, but between emerging markets and developed countries? Uh, and is there enough firepower? Is there enough um, uh, capability to ensure mm -hmm. that doesn't happen? Well, we are very concerned about emerging markets uh, and, and developing economies because on top of being hit by the pandemic itself and having to join the uh, great lockdown, they're faced with additional fairly serious problems. Those of them that are commodity exporters, and many are, are hit by collapse of uh, commodity and oil prices. Those that depend on the injection of capital, and practically everybody in this group depends on that, are seeing flight to safety of gigantic proportions, much bigger than during the global financial crisis. $100 billion have left emerging markets because of this fear of the unknown. And then many of these countries depend on remittances. Remittances have shrunk. 
uh, we are estimating some 20 to 30 percent already decline of remittances. Uh, I am particularly worried about countries that even before this crisis were in a weaker position, uh, the same way the virus hits more severely those that have preconditions with weaker immune systems, the crisis hits weaker countries much more severely. Uh, so when we look at the emerging markets and developing economies, we did a rough estimate. Um, actually, I need to add a couple of zeros to your number. Uh, it is actually $2.5 trillion that we think the needs there are, and uh, countries are short of hundreds of billions to be able to meet these needs. Yes, they have built reserves. Many of them actually have pursued good policies, but similarly, there are many uh, countries in this group that have been under the burden of debt already before the uh, coronavirus uh, hit. So uh, how is the fund looking at the, at the picture uh, there? One, of course, we are leaning forward. This is what I learned you do in crisis. Be decisive, move fast. Uh, by providing emergency finance, financing, uh, we got over 100 requests. And I'm very proud to say that in uh, six weeks, we got almost half of these requests already processed and the money disbursed. Uh, we are also looking into focus on the most vulnerable countries. These are the poorest countries. And their very good success of uh, the call we made with uh, David Malpass for debt moratorium for poor countries. Uh, but then would come the next, the next wave when countries are faced with uh, a more prolonged period of time of shrinkage of the world economy. Uh, so where are we as an institution? Uh, the good news uh, is that we have four times more money today than before the global financial crisis. So the global financial crisis pushed the world to uh, expand the uh, capabilities uh, of, of the fund. We have $1 trillion lending capacity. And in any conversation I have had with the shareholders of the fund, uh, they would like us to stay focused on delivering with what we have, but not shy away of assessing the situation. Uh, so. If more needs to be done, one of uh, our ministers would say it, uh, all options on the table. If more needs to be done, we will be able to step up and do it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, um, that answer. So we're starting to get some questions on uh, in online. And I, I hesitated to put this at the top of my questions because for the layman, uh, the uh, SDRs is hard to understand. Special ah. rights. Uh, but a lot of the questions circle mm -hmm. around. This is, yep. the, this is the one thing that did not happen uh, uh, at this mm -hmm. meeting in full. And obviously there are political questions on this. Mm -hmm. So I, how critical is it that uh, there is a increase, maybe even as much by a trillion dollars in special drawing rights? Mm -hmm. Are they very quickly? Um, and, uh, and is this what could make you an international lender of last resort? Because a lot of people say that's what's missing in the picture is an international lender of lost resort. There's also some talk about working with central banks on swaps and that sort of thing. Mm. But, but you said all options are on the table. Yeah. Are, are those options on the table too? So let me first say as clearly as I can, we are a lender of last resort. And we are acting as such for the countries that have received already lifelines of emergency financial assistance, they have one message to the fund and it is, thank God you're there. Uh, we are well capitalized in terms of the uh, next months, the needs that are being projected by, by emerging economies and developing countries. But as I said, if we are in a worse situation than our scenario of minus 3% growth, it might be necessary for the fund to step up even further. 
Uh, during the global financial crisis, one of the instruments that helped the fund to act was the issuance of uh, 250 billion SDRs. Uh, for those who don't know what it is, it is like paper gold. When we issue an SDR allocation, every country gets more liquidity instantaneously. But SDRs have some uh, sides of them uh, that in a crisis uh, we need to pause on. The first one is it takes time. It takes five months. In these days, it took five months uh, to get from uh, an agreement of the board of directors to, to issuing the allocation. And the second one, which some of the membership are uh, uncomfortable with, is it goes to everybody. It goes to countries that need it, and it goes to countries that don't need it. Advanced economies that have their own uh, hard currency, they're not benefiting from SDRs. And in the ownership of the fund, advanced economies are 62%. So, and there are some other hesitations among the mem membership. Where we are today is there are many who are saying, don't take SDRs off the table. Of course, we won't. But we are not yet at the point when we have that unity of purpose that we got on doubling access to emergency financing, on coming with short-term liquidity line, on increasing our concessional financing, on debt relief. And I just list those because we need to recognize that at the time when we need to keep the world together, it is actually very important not only to act, but to build unity of purpose in action. Uh, on SDRs, uh, the conversation I'm sure would, would continue. At this point, in the spirit of now, act with what we have now, we are looking into the existing SDRs. Many advanced economies have SDRs from the previous allocation. Doesn't do any good for them but they are developing countries for which these SDRs, if we, if we find a way to transfer, they would be a major injection of liquidity. Uh, so act, act on where we have the, uh, the world uh, together and continue to build commonality of purpose where there are still uh, differences in views. So the spirit of now, build the commonality purpose. And I think this next question uh, that has come in um, touches on this. And, and uh, um, it, it is a question, uh, could Madam Georgiev, Georgieva please contrast the international and domestic effort to address mm. uh, COVID-19 in terms of boldness and scope. And I think yep. you know what's behind this. It is a question of compared to 2008, 2009, do not have as much international commonality of purpose as we had then, and therefore is domestic actually leading the international commonality of purpose? Uh, let me go back to uh, what I said in, in the beginning, that this is a truly global crisis. Everybody hurts. And it is a crisis with very high degree of unknown, uncertainty. As a result, what we have seen is stepping up domestic efforts, and understandably so, if people are dying in your constituencies and they are begging you to take action to protect lives and also to protect livelihoods, to come up with a bridge uh, over this huge slump in the economy, then it is understandable that we have seen very massive engagement. Not only it is understandable, it is actually great because when large economies are stepping up and they are protecting from a dramatic collapse, that has positive spillover effect for the whole world. So, and actions have been unprecedented the same way this crisis is unprecedented. Eight trillion dollars of fiscal measures. I mean, in comparison with the global financial crisis, 1.5% uh, of GDP more. Massive injection of liquidity from uh, central banks. 
I also would argue that we, we have seen the world coming together uh, in record short time, an agreement on moratorium on bilateral official debt under the G20 umbrella. And for those who are following these uh, issues closely, bringing everybody, the Paris Club, China, India, the Gulf, everybody in a record short time. This is not a minor achievement. Uh, we also have seen in our discussions of the IMF tremendous support of the membership, uh, similarly in the discussions at the World Bank. And I recognize uh, that in this moment of time, we have an extra responsibility to bring a strong international response, urge for it, call for it, beg for it, champion it. And that is what we have done during our spring meetings. And I can tell you, uh, I, 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 was, I was actually very pleased with the uh, outcome because it gives us a, an impetus to do much more. I mean, just to give you the uh, comparison, twice as much in, in uh, emergency financing agreed within uh, a short period of time, virtually within within 10 days. No, it's, it's really remarkable what, you're, what you were able to move that the IMF had tried to move in many respects before, and you saw that you were able to animate things in a very short period of time. Um, let's move to fiscal a uh, fiscal question. So the Atlantic Council uh, today uh, has released a groundbreaking tracker, a fiscal tracker. And yes. G20 fiscal spending from the global financial crisis today. It's really worth looking at. We'll try to get it around to the people who are listening on this call, but it's at our website, atlanticcouncil.org. What's interesting in it for me, and this is also, uh, we're able to en engineer this partly because of the expertise of IMF's Josh Lippi, who has come to us, so it's just it's fantastic. But what's great about this tracker is it shows you that um, uh, for all the money that you cited that's out there, uh, China and India fiscally have not put so much in. And I wonder what particularly could speak to the issue of China as it seems to be the first emerging uh, toward, toward growth and whether, uh, how are you looking at China and where it's going and whether uh, the world should actually expect extra response perhaps from China, particularly in the fiscal realm? Well, uh, since um, you mentioned the fiscal tracker, congratulations for getting it out. I also want to refer to a policy action tracker that we, we also run at the fund for, for 193 countries uh, it looks at all measures that are being put in place, including fiscal measures. But we were very pleased to see that uh, the Atlantic Council took the fiscal uh, aspect one step forward to compare to the uh, global financial crisis. Uh, so two uh, points on China. The first one is that uh, in comparison with 2008-2009, uh, China has... Uh, not that much in terms of uh, fiscal space. It has plenty, but in 2008-2009, uh, China was in a position because it did not have a hit on its own economy in the uh, uh, large magnitude that it has been uh, in advanced economies. Uh, to lead the emerging markets out of the uh, global financial crisis. Uh, now China is acting uh, actually quite uh, uh, significantly. Uh, it has put in our estimate uh, around 5% of GDP in uh, various forms of uh, measures. And China is thinking that there would be, uh, if you wish, a second bite of this apple. Uh, when a fiscal stimulus is to be put in place to energize the recovery. Uh, so my expectation is that we will see more being done uh, uh, by China. Uh, so far, they have been very prudent. Their measures are well targeted. Uh, some of these measures are clearly temporary. In other words, when they need to be uh, withdrawn, they will be uh, withdrawn. Uh, and in that sense, uh, 
we see we see a um, a good uh, good overall action uh, there. But my second point is for the rest of the world. This crisis is like uh, a uh, domino. Countries falling one after another, after another, after another, being hit dramatically by the pandemic, then by the restrictive measures to contain the, the, the pandemic. It hasn't happened all at the same time. And as a result, what we see is that, that gradually this wave of actions moves towards uh, the countries that are later comers in terms of how the pandemic hits. Uh, you look at, uh, just to give one example, country like Indonesia, it is now feeling more the heat of the pandemic. It is taking very aggressive uh, both uh, fiscal uh, and uh, central bank liquidity uh, measures to counter the negative impact of what they have to do, which is restrict their own economic uh, activities. What is hugely important for us is to learn from each other. And in that sense, your track is a very welcome um, uh, contribution. And what we do at the fund to be a transmission line of experience. And I'll tell you something very interesting. We had virtual meetings, but they were incredibly engaged and productive. And we had all our regional segments of the uh, uh, spring meetings uh, as if we are in kind of in the traditional spring meeting format and everybody at the, at the top level would be there to hear from us but most importantly to hear from each other uh, the uh, in many respects this digital world can also bring us closer together it's very interesting to see that unfold um, I wonder we I've got a couple of other questions that I'm going to link together here as we uh, get into our our final uh, our final minutes uh, one of them is uh, talking about uh, uh, Nigeria and oil, mm -hmm. and really the question of uh, the twin shock and countries that get this twin mm -hmm. shock, uh, and 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 is there a particular strain on these commodity exporters? And that really leads me to a related question, which is debt. You know, we may get mm -hmm. through, but uh, mm -hmm. are you worried about the impact of debt in 2021 and beyond? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, first on Nigeria, uh, it is uh, one of the countries that are more severely hit because there is this uh, incredible drop in oil prices uh, that is uh, handicapping uh, uh, economies dependent on uh, oil exports. Uh, we are working uh, very rapidly to provide a significant emergency financing uh, to Nigeria, actually, uh, I expect this to be done uh, by the end of the month. Uh, uh, but beyond that, um, clearly the lesson uh, from this crisis is one that the fund has been repeating time and again. Diversify your economies, build buffers during good times so you can withstand bad time. And we see among the uh, oil exporters, some countries that have done more of it and they are in a stronger position and some that have uh, more vulnerabilities. Uh, looking into the debt situation, uh, very clearly the world is building up much more debt to counter the necessity to be in this great uh, lockdown. It has to be done. And our advice as the fund is do as much as you can and then do a little bit more because this is only the only way for us to go through this uh, uh, first stage of the, of the uh, crisis. Coming on the other side, our expectation is that uh, interest rates are likely to re remain low for a long time. And that means uh, that uh, in 2021, uh, we would see that stabilizing at a somewhat higher level, but still in relatively uh, not dramatic conditions in terms of how much you pay to service this uh, debt. And there has to be thinking today how to jumpstart the economy so over time this debt burden can shrink. Uh, and we are very much in favor of thinking today about a uh, preferably coordinated fiscal stimulus that can 
generate a new momentum for the world economy. We would like this new momentum to be, to be green. We want to see the economy being more resilient. And we want to see the economy paying, every country paying more attention on what are the opportunities that can give an extra momentum. Uh, and I mentioned the digital uh, economy. Very clearly, it would be the big winner of, uh, of this crisis. What else can be done uh, to make uh, local businesses uh, more vibrant? Uh, we do expect to see more local purchases that may give a good boost to, uh, to uh, sustainable agri local agriculture. Uh, we would see, hopefully, more um, communities uh, being, being more, more vibrant. That would mean uh, good, uh, good news for, uh, for the uh, uh, small uh, shopkeepers. But all of this uh, uh, today is still one big question mark that we need to work on and give answers as, as prudently and, again, depending on this learning from uh, each other. Madam Georgiev, thank you for that. Let, let, let me give you the sort of last two questions, both of which build off other things you've said. One is really wanting you to drill down a little bit on uh, the debt agreement of this from Kostas Panitsopoulos, a member of the executive committee of the Atlantic Council Board. And it's really drilling down on the uh, debt agreement, uh, debt agreements. Uh, how many countries mm -hmm. have come to the IMF for additional assistance? And can you talk more in detail about the debt agreement and uh, mm -hmm. and then what to watch? And then I think yeah. the, a closing a closing one, because I mm -hmm. think you touched on climate, and we've had a number mm -hmm. of questions, uh, people because people are concerned that we could lose our focus on climate yeah. this period of time with everything else pointed at us. So how do we? Mm -hmm. And you've yep. been a leader in this area, and you've tried to lead the fund in this area. Yeah. What do you see as the next step? So on the debt agreements. Um, uh, the uh, moratorium on official bilateral that uh, is being worked out, we expect it to come into force on May 1st. In meanwhile, good progress is being made with private creditors so they can uh, join voluntarily on the basis of a standardized approach, harmonized, standardized, so it, there is no risk of... Uh, moral hazard of some winning from the fact that others are doing the right thing and standing still in terms of that service. Uh, we also need to look at country by country where debt vulnerabilities may be more significant. And uh, the uh, World Bank and the IMF got a mandate during the spring meetings to do exactly uh, that. And of course, uh, we would need a, a very uh, prudent uh, strategy of engagement with creditors to make sure that we are uh, creating uh, public good rather than uh, risk and additional vulnerabilities. Uh, on the question of, of climate, uh, look, Mother Nature is not going to let us forget that climate change is a major risk to the well-being of people and the well-being of economies. So I know that right now we are rightly, we are concentrated on the immediate emergency and rightly so. But as we deal with uh, uh, COVID-19 and we restart economies, it is a great opportunity to see what are the policies that we can put in place and even accelerate so we have resilient climate friendly growth in the future. Uh, because if we don't, then we are going to see an acceleration of another type of risk, and it is the climate risk. Uh, the pandemic is unique because it hits everybody at the same time. Uh, climate disasters uh, affect different regions at a different moment. But in their aggregation, they are quite uh, significant. Uh, so what are the areas we can pursue? Well, our, our prices are very low. Very good moment to phase out uh, harmful subsidies, taking advantage of these low, low oil prices. Uh, the necessity to rely on uh, 
food supplies uh, that are sustainable, that is a good uh, reason to move into, into green uh, agriculture, sustainable agriculture. Uh, we would have mortgages, people would have difficulty to service their mortgages. What if we decide to have a program that if you retrofit your house, you get a discount on how you service your debt or you have a, a prolongation of servicing that debt. There are many policy ideas that can serve us really well. So we come in a way uh, better off. Uh, you know, a crisis never to be missed as an opportunity to do uh, better. And I want to finish, I'm doing the same in my own institution. I'm looking at the way we work now, all in uh, from home, all virtually. Well, I don't have any intention when this, when this crisis is over. And as Lincoln uh, would say, this shall also pass. I'm not going to beg the way it was. It's going to be better. Madam Georgieva, what a wonderful note to end on. On behalf of everybody listening in, uh, let me thank you. Your quote, why is this a crisis like no other? You told us that. 170 countries now projected for down, uh, a, a downdraft, economic downdraft, when 160 were supposed to have growth. The focus on uncertainty and then this wonderful statement, what do we want the world to be for our children? Thank you for your leadership and thank you for your inspiration toward greater global unity uh, uh, and a greater uh, effort of uh, shaping the world together. Thank you, Madam Georgieva. Thank you for having me.